I'm going to turn this off here. Okay, so here we are, one in the word, uh, week 42, Thursday, February 4th, 2021. And the text that we're going to use this Sunday uh, are among <laughs> Isaiah 40, verses 21 to 31, a servant for the sake of the gospel, and then Mark 1, 29 to 39 which is also about a servant for the sake of the gospel, but it's talking about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Okay, so there we are. We'll read the text. We'll review the text. I'll talk a little bit about the historical setting uh, when we get to the gospel lesson. Also uh, a little bit about the first lesson. And then uh, we'll look at the questions. And just to prepare you for the reading now, what words or details stand out after hearing the text? You might want to jot something down. What questions did it create for you? And what do you think it meant to the people who heard it originally? And that's actually uh, a double message there because when you're dealing with something like Isaiah, you're dealing not only with uh, uh, the written text of Isaiah, which was written at, at a later date, but also the, um, the actual prophecy and the you know, proclamation that uh, is at the heart of the text itself. So it's a kind of a, a double whammy there. Okay, let's, uh, we need someone who wants to read because there's a lot to read. I'll read it. Okay. Isaiah 40, 21 to 31, okay. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens, who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Okay. That's the text. So <clears throat> any, uh, let me say something in the very beginning here. <clears throat> this is from Isaiah chapter 40, and that's a particularly significant uh, marking uh, right there because um, the, uh, the text of Isaiah seems to be uh, in three sections. Uh, the first section is uh, the pre-exilic section uh, in other words, before the uh, people of Judah are taken away into exile in Babylon. Then uh, you get to chapter 40 and uh, the whole mood and, and the meaning of the text seems to shift dramatically. And uh, it takes on a much more positive note. Uh, comfort, comfort my people is the beginning of chapter 40, for example. You've heard that text many times during Advent. Uh, and then uh, around uh, somewhere in the, in the 60s, 
uh, the text changes again a third time. Uh, and so that's why uh, biblical scholars have, have seen the book of Isaiah as being a composite of three, uh, three different sets of prophecy all under the uh, uh, Isaiah tradition, you might say. Um, it's just a way of trying to get insight into the uh, nature of the text itself. Um, it is not so much an uh, effort to uh, challenge the authority of the scriptures or anything like that, uh, but it's simply saying this is, a, this is what we've got, how are we going to make uh, the best reading of what it is actually saying to us. Having said that, <clears throat> the, there, I included the um, introductory phrase here from the um, Sundays and Seasons. The Judeans in exile have a good reason to be hopeful. The one who will bring them to freedom is the God who created the world, the God who subdues the rulers of the earth and gives strength to those who are weary. And that in one long sentence summarizes everything that you just read. <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, so. Is it possible that Isaiah was written by more than one person? Well, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what the scholars uh, uh, Sounds like. are trying to say, yeah. That there's really three, three separate generations uh, involved. It's not even a matter of, uh, you know, three people sitting in the same room. It's no, no, no. three people at different times. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That was my point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, uh, they call it, you know, Deutero, Isaiah, and... Trito or Trito uh, Isaiah. Um, and that's uh, a scholarly way of, of getting at the whole question of how we're going to interpret this uh, in its appropriate context mm -hmm. uh, from which it originates, you know. So here, what, what have we got here? Um, any comments that you want to make about any of these words here? Uh, in addition to what Ed did? Well, the words that stuck out to me was verse 25 mm. that says, um, to whom then will you compare me? You know, like, like um, we have some people, um, what, how should I say that? Some people have other gods. And so are we comparing our God to another God? You know, sometimes we put things ahead of God, such as money or possessions. Mm -hmm. And those become our gods. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can comment more on that in a minute. Are there other comments uh, for questions like that? <clears throat> I was looking at verse 26 where it says, He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Is that okay. calling each of us, I guess? What's that? Is that calling each of us by name or? No, what did you, uh, your text actually is, is uh, clarifies it a little bit. Why don't you read the beginning part of what you read before just now? It says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Okay. Yeah, he's talking about the starry host you mentioned. Right. It's, it's not in the text on the screen. <clears throat> and, uh, and adding that word uh, helps to explain what he's referring to. Mm -hmm. Talking about the heavens above, looking okay. at the stars up there. Yeah. Oh, okay. God numbers them and calls them all by name. Okay. All right. Every year around Christmas time, there are advertisements on the on the radio or wherever, uh, you know, how you can uh, uh, donate or purchase a star and have it have the name of that star put in the star registry. So I could I could buy a star for uh. my <laughs> wife here, and it would be uh, uh, named after her. And that would go into the star registry, which is uh, recorded and uh, preserved in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Hmm. So that's uh, you really kind of wonder what's the sense of that? You know? <laughs> I mean, 
who are these people anyway that they're going to name the stars and you know and at what cost? Which one, you know, and so on. I mean, it's just incredible. But people pay for it, so um, mm -hmm. you might as well make some money, right? <laughs> But anyway, he brings out this, uh, the starry hosts and numbers them, calling them all by name is really just to say that, you know, the one who gives names to things is greater than that oh. which is named. Okay. And we have the same thing, uh, incidentally, in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 2, where uh, Adam and Eve named the animals. Mm -hmm. Adam names the animals, I guess. Eve hasn't uh, come on the scene yet, but he names all the animals. He gives names to all the animals. And it's the same sort of thing. So it shows that Adam is superior to uh, the animals. Okay. That's the uh, message underneath the message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Mm -hmm. No. God knows all the stars up there. I correlate that to people. You know, he he knows each one of us. Well, that's that's uh, you know Jesus talking uh, in in the Sermon on the Mount. That's mm -hmm. where that idea comes from. Right. But this is talking about the stars. Mm. Yeah. So. Uh, then the argument, okay, we have Sue Soper is going to join us. Hold on here. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to have to flex with this in a little bit. But anyway, um, so, you know, it, this is a kind of a, uh, you have to ask who is uh, talking in what particular place, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So who is talking? Uh, it, you know, the, the, have you not known, have you not heard, and so on. Uh, who is the speaker there? Who's asking that question? Okay. Um, I guess that's the prophet that's asking that question, right? Because in the next verse, 22, it says, it is he who sits above the heaven. So somebody is talking about God at that point, mm -hmm. right? And scarcely are they planted and so on. And then... Uh, but then we get to verse 25. <laughs> to whom then will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. So there should, be, in effect, there should be quotation marks there. Mm -hmm. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. This is God talking now. Mm -hmm. Brings out their hosts and so on. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? That's all God asking those questions. My way is hidden from the Lord. And my right is disregarded by my God. And now God is, and now the prophet is saying, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and so on. So it's kind of interesting, you know, that that the, uh, the speaker changes within the text itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's subject to interpretation. I mean, you know, you may read that and say, well, you know, I see it a different way, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. You know, it's... Uh, Describing, you know, the situation of human beings with uh, respect to God. It is very confusing. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to kind of... Uh, I'm trying to read uh, chapter, uh, uh, verse 27. Yeah, I'll, there, I'll, get, I'll get to that in a second. Um, 
But anyway, this is what God does. He brings the, uh, the princes to naught. He makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. In other words, you know, mm -hmm. God is superior to princes and rulers. Uh, scarcely, they're just, you know, they're planted, they're sown, they just take root, and then he blows on them, and away they go. You know, the tempest carries them off like stubble. And then God says, to whom will you then compare me? Who is my equal? Lift up your eyes on high. Who created all these stars, right? And uh, and why do you say, O oh, Jacob, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Think about that. He's saying, do you think I'm not watching? Mm -hmm. You know? You think I'm not paying attention to what you're doing? You think I've forgotten about you? You know? Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. So, Ed, you were raising a question about verse 27 there? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to figure out who's speaking. Yeah. Oh, Jacob, and speak, O oh, Israel. Yeah. My way is hidden from the Lord. I don't understand who's speaking. Well, the prophet is... is uh, Telling us what God is thinking, so to speak. Oh, okay. That's how I read it. But it does get confusing because he goes back and forth within the text itself. Mm -hmm. You know, at the top of the line here, he who brings out their hosts and numbers them. It, it sounds like, you know, somebody's talking about God in the third person. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, you know, he's uh, calling Israel to account. So the prophet is asking that question, but uh, he's speaking for God there. So what, we're, what we're hearing then is three voices in this. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what makes it confusing. You're right. Mm -hmm. But here now, again, there's a prophet. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. In other words, there's no limit to God's understanding. Yes. Uh, there's no limit to his power. He has a power. Uh, he gives power to the faint, strengthens the powerless. This is a little different from omnipotent, though, because this is God exercising his power. Mm -hmm. He gives power. He strengthens, okay? Um, it's a little different from the Greek idea of God being omnipotent, uh, all-powerful, able to do everything everywhere at all times and so on. Yeah. Now here, even youths will faint and be weary. The young will fall exhausted. And here's a, a verse that is uh, a favorite for a lot of people. Those who wait for the Lord, they leave out the word, but those who wait, <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the hymn of the day uh, for Sunday, I uh, will give you a hint. On oh, eagle's wings? On eagle's wings, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will raise them up. That's great eagle's song. wings, yeah. Yeah. Raise yeah. Good song. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. So there's a, a meaning there, you know, saying, mm -hmm. look, you know, you're not in charge here. God is in charge. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, uh, if God is really in charge, then what we do is we wait for the Lord. But the promise is, if you wait for the Lord or when you wait for the Lord, the Lord renews your strength. And uh, you'll have the ability to mount up with wings like eagles. I, you know, I don't think we take that too literally. <laughs> As we get into the story of Icarus, uh, who made the wings and tried to fly up and got too close to the sun and the wax melted and down he went. Uh, you know that story, right? Greek mm -hmm. mythology. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's uh, really a word to the people of Israel that things are going to get better. Yep. That God is still with them. Mm -hmm. 
And keep in mind that they have gone through 50 years of exile in Babylon. And this word now is coming to them saying, you know, you've been waiting on the Lord. Now the time is coming. God will renew your strength and uh, you'll be able to run and walk and, you know, return to normal. How is that? An interesting phrase. So anyway, what do you think? Uh, what more do you think it says to the people uh, who heard this text? Don't give up. Yeah. Don't give I up. Think Things will get better, like you just said. Yeah. And I think that speaks to us today. Yeah, yeah. I think it says we have a big God. Yeah. Because it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and all its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. So, you know, he's a big God. In, in the light of all of our problems, we think they're so big, but our problems are so small and our God is, is very big. Um, I had a note you were talking about that last verse waiting on the Lord renew their strength and it says to look at Isaiah um, 41 10 and it says fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you yes I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand now keep in mind that this is written to people who have been in exile mm -hmm. and who are going to be returning from exile, making that journey from Babylon to uh, Judah, a journey of some 600 miles. They're going to come to uh, a city that is in ruins, uh, that has been overgrown 50 years now. Uh, the buildings have been torn down, the houses have been burned, the temple has been destroyed. Uh, all of the stuff that they left there, and many of these folks, of course, are the children of the ones who left there because 50 years is a long time for anybody. And uh, in sure those 50 years, it's not like uh, in Genesis where they lived to be seven or 800 years old. Uh, 50 years in these days was a lot of time. Um, but anyway, saying to them, don't, don't give up when the word comes for you to get back to the Holy Land. God's going to lead you back. You think about, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's like, well, conversation this morning, for example, we we're talking a little bit about article news, say, where it said that, you know, even after people have all been vaccinated, mm -hmm. uh, from COVID and so on and so forth, we're probably still going to have to wear masks, you know? And, uh, and I thought to myself, wow, you know? It's like, we, we become so comfortable in a particular given situation that we won't even, uh, when the time comes that we don't have to live that way, we'll continue living that way anyway. Mm. It's kind of scary when you think it about is it. very scary yeah but you know I wonder, I wonder how many of those jews they were called jews at that point because they were from judah that's where they got the, the name jew uh in exile in babylon um i wonder how many of those jews especially the second generation jews the ones who grew up who were born in babylon okay i wonder how many of them were really eager to go back Especially if they knew what they were going to have to face. Weren't they promised the land of milk and honey? Well, well, that was the original promise. And yeah, that, that was their heritage. That's for sure. Yeah. That, that was war. That was, that was the myth of their culture. Yeah, right, right. But that's part of the Moses culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is now several hundred years later. You know, seven or eight hundred years later, mm -hmm. which again is a long period of time if you think as an American. What was it like seven hundred years ago in this country? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, there was no America from an American point of view. Right. 
Yeah. But, you know, here they're being, they're going to be told. And that's the message of Isaiah, really. Uh, you're going to go home. Mm -hmm. And later on, you know, and this is where the other, uh, the minor prophets come in. Uh, I was watching the video about Nehemiah yesterday and, uh, and Haggai, Haggai and Nehemiah. Um, they uh, were contemporaries. And uh, Nehemiah, after the destruction, of, uh, after the conquest of Babylon, um, goes to uh, Cyrus of Persia and says, I, I'm willing to take the people back. And Cyrus says, go ahead, bring them back, send them back, you know, and uh, I will provide you with the things that you need to rebuild uh, Jerusalem and the temple and all that and so they go back and it's an interesting story there's an interesting YouTube video about Nehemiah about how they uh, went back and they rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem and then uh, and Haggai talks about rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem but that's all I had on YouTube? yeah you can find it on YouTube if you just uh, you go to YouTube and you type in Nehemiah and look for, uh, you know, some videos that are like six or seven minutes long. Okay. You can find an hour and a half video too there, but <laughs> <laughs> I like to read, uh, watch this. Uh, six this minutes is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I could probably show it to you. I have it in my computer here somewhere. <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> that's what they have ahead of them. And so that's one of the reasons this particular text is so important. This is a, it's kind of like a pep talk, hmm. a prophetic pep talk, you know? Hmm. Um, yeah, you know, you, you, you'll you be able to go back home. And yeah, it is in ruins. Yeah, the th place has been overgrown. Uh, you don't know what you're going to get into when you get back there. But it is the land promised to uh, the people, children of Israel, a land flowing with milk and honey. And if you go back there, you'll be able to continue uh, to experience the blessing of God, the promise given to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Okay. So, you know, a lot of stuff is going on here. And we kind of lose track of that when we look at the Bible because we forget that these passages of scripture are written over a period of centuries mm. and you know centuries from each other and you know and here in our country a couple of centuries a long time mm. it was for them too <laughs> so waiting on the lord um but then having your strength renewed so this is a very inspirational text and as you said, uh, as you said before, it, it really is speaking to us right now. But it also points us in the right direction. Because um, what are we waiting for? We're we waiting for Congress? Are we waiting for the president? Or are we waiting for the Lord? And we're waiting for Jesus to return. Ultimately. To yeah, ultimately, but I, you know, that's that's the big picture. <laughs> but I'm thinking in terms of our future, you know, in the short run. Yeah, we wait for the Lord. Right. Yeah, and uh, you know, let every, everything else uh, uh, fill in the, you know, color in the uh, between the lines and so on. Let the Congress act. Let the President act. Let the people act. Uh, we all have a uh, share in the whole thing, but uh, ultimately it's the Lord that will renew our strength. Mm -hmm. we, we look at this from a purely, what you're saying is purely American standpoint. Yeah. yeah. People in the world who are slaves. That's right. That's yeah. right. And right. so from our standpoint, we're a free nation. Yeah. We think and we live differently. Yeah. And people in other areas of the world. What's yeah. happening over in China? They're, they're killing them, the Christians. Yeah, well, they're killing Christians, they're killing Muslims, big time. Yeah, I mean, it's really bad. Yeah. There. They're, they're, 
they're overpopulating their environment. They've now <coughs> put through laws that says you can only have one child right. because they, there's not enough land to support them. Yeah, and they're not creative enough to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Well, I don't know that that's true, but I, I wonder if they don't look at it and say that how many people an acre can support. Well, that's that's a positive construction of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But a government that's, you know, a communist government that sees the uh, sees the, the corporate identity as being of greater value than the individual. Yes. Individual freedom, individual liberty, individual rights and all the rest. Uh, that really doesn't matter in a communist uh, way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, those things are uh, not important. Uh, what's really important is is the you know the, the whole the party and the, and the the, uh, the corporate sense. So if you lose a hundred thousand people here or there, it's not a big deal uh, as long as you know the conditions get better. So that explains a lot about why COVID is. Uh, here in the United States and everywhere else. The philosophy of life that says the individuals don't matter. So, but to God, the individuals do matter. Amen. And that's one of the things that keeps us going. Okay, I wanna move along here and uh, we'll move into, uh, again, think about uh, the text that's coming up and Text that's coming up is from Mark. And it's a continuation. We're still in the first chapter of Mark. And this is like four weeks. All right. So these are the. I'm good with that. All right. So who'd like to read Mark 1 20, 29 to 39? I'll read. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve <coughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm missing the top. Yeah. <laughs> 32. Uh, okay. Let me see. I, I got it here in my Bible. Oh, there you go. No, evening, go on. It's, yeah. On evening at sunset, they brought <clears> to <throat> all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various disease, diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. <laughs> in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed, and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Okay. So, here's just a little bit of background again to make you uh, put it in context. You notice in this uh, map that we have here, there is that red marker. That's where Capernaum is. Uh, that's where all of this is taking place. Um, <clears throat> And uh, uh, above, uh, to the right of the uh, red mark is Bethsaida. That's where Jesus uh, came across um, Andrew and Simon, James and John. Uh, but then they uh, returned down along the shoreline there to Capernaum, where Peter uh, lived with his mother-in-law and with his brother Andrew. And presumably Mrs. Peter, whoever that is. We don't know anything about her at all. We don't even know if she's still alive at this point. Uh, you know, judging from the fact that Peter went off with Jesus for three years, uh, it probably wasn't a very close marriage or uh, 
she traveled along and didn't say much. Anyway, uh, there were women that traveled with Jesus and the disciples, but you really don't hear about them too often. So that's where this is all taking place. And here's a, a picture now of the ruins that have been excavated there from uh, the original city. You can see to the left is some of the um, entrances to the synagogue at Capernaum uh, from the fourth to sixth century AD. Way in the background to the right over here, um, if I can get my, yeah, over here you see this dome that is, uh, and you see the wall right here? Yeah. Right in front of it? Um, what happened to my, there we go. <laughs> Uh, this wall, this wall separates the Roman Catholic property, the Franciscan property, from the Greek Orthodox property. This mm -hmm. is the Greek Orthodox Church of Capernaum, okay? And over here we see, we see uh, Ed in the background, <laughs> 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 judging from the hat, yeah. <laughs> uh. Anyway, uh, no, that's not really Ed, but it looked, you know, passable. Uh, here's the church uh, that was built over the remains of, uh, of the house of Peter and his mother-in-law. Uh, you, you know, all of this, of course, is very contemporary. Um, and I'll show you a couple more pictures here. This is what it looked like uh, when it was first excavated. You notice that the church is not there. <laughs> Right? It's a, something's missing from that picture that you just saw. Right. It's, it's, right? All that is built over wow. this. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> the first two times, I think, when I went to Israel, uh, that's what I saw. Right. So I could have taken that picture myself. Mm -hmm. I probably did, but I'm not going to go looking for it. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, you notice uh, the shape of the house. Yeah. It's octagonal. Actually, you know? It is an octagonal. Yeah, yeah it was, it's octagon. Why? Yeah. And you notice in the, in the center part, that's kind of a common area. Mm. That would also, I suppose, be the area that you'd go into if somebody was attacking you. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the safe room or whatever, you know. Uh, but it was a communal room. Uh, and then around the edges of it, you have these uh, you have these areas where there would be places where people could uh, have rooms, bedrooms. And now you notice this area here, and this I think is part of the part of the approach that uh, they had in those days as families grew. Oh, you know, you add on to the house. Now we lived for 10 years up in Massachusetts and Massachusetts that's a very common thing, uh, but the houses are not octagonal, So you wind up with some very strange looking houses in Massachusetts uh, and in New England in general. Um, but this is uh, much neater. <laughs> <clears throat> they simply put another wall around and then that added all that extra space. So that's really, you know, the answer if any of you you know, want to have more space. You just add another wall and then build in. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, the fact of the matter is that the population was growing. Yeah, right. well, yeah, just keep in mind the population of Capernaum was estimated to be about 1,500 people in those days, which is a rather large area. And out in places like North Dakota and South Dakota, it would be a large town even now, <laughs> 1,500 people. But that, uh, that was underneath uh, the church building that was built over it. And, you know, the, the third or fourth time I went to Israel, the church building was already done. This is an overview of Capernaum as it looks today. <clears throat> now, this is that wall that I was referring to. You notice that the Franciscans have done a nice job here. They kind of made this into a nice area and uh, mm. they've excavated all of this stuff here. This is 
you know, that's the town of Capernaum. It's kind of like, you know, Minneapolis after the summer. Uh, you can just see the foundations of things. Mm. You know? And a uh, little service road going around here that, that they built. Uh, mm. it, this is not original, I'm sure. And then you have, this is the Greek Orthodox version of the excavation that you see on this side. So you can see the Greeks were not as interested in uh, making a tourist location. Mm -mm. All right. You notice here you have like a dock going out into the sea. Mm. And uh, in the early days of my travels over there, uh, there would be boats that would come across mm. and they would come over here and they would dock. And that's how you would get to Capernaum. And then afterwards, after you had visited the, the uh, remains there, then a bus would show up over here somewhere in the parking lot. So you could continue. But anyway, this is a church that was built, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the synagogue. And you remember that was, uh, uh, the guy claimed that was the largest synagogue that they've uncovered in <sighs> Italy. And there are over 70 synagogues that they've, you know, uncovered. So this is a big, big building. Okay. <laughs> And over along here, there would be the, the fishing ponds and stuff like that. So when the boats came with all the fish in the nets, they would just dump them in the ponds. And that way they didn't have to refrigerate them or let them rot. <laughs> so anyway, moving right along. This is the inside of that church. Wow. See, we've never seen that. I've never been inside. Wow. That's we saw the outside, right? Yeah, we just saw, you know, we stood underneath it, but we never yeah. got that close. Yeah, they were having a service in there when we were there. We couldn't go in. Yeah, but you notice here, uh, well, first of all, you notice the light. It's tremendous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. amount of light they have. Yeah. Then here is the altar. Oh. Right? And you notice the seating is, all, is kind of uh, around the altar, behind the altar, oh, and yeah. to the sides of the altar. <laughs> and obviously people in this kind of condition can see one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, similar to, you know, uh, in essence, what we have in our church, where mm. people can see one another. And then you have this interesting structure here. Yeah. Fence. Which uh, is not octagonal, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a pentagon, I guess. It's five-sided. But oh. if you look straight through here, this is yeah. glass. Oh. All in here. And these are all, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So these are all, you know, five-sided uh, things there. That's why this has to be five-sided, you know. Uh, the guy who was making the glass said five sides is all you get. Anyway, <coughs> uh, if you were standing right, uh, right here on the edge, you would look down and you would see that, uh, that structure that I showed you before from the original House of Peter. Now, how do they know it's a House of Peter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did they go to the uh, you know town hall and look up the uh, paperwork and so on? Uh, no. Um, when they first started excavating in this area, they um, they uncovered uh, what they considered to be the remains of a church built during the Byzantine era. Okay, that would be somewhere uh, 500, 600, something like that A.D. Right, and why did why was the church built there? Well, because the, uh, the Byzantine Christians, the Orthodox, in other words, as they would ultimately be called, but this is before uh, the Great Schism, um, they uh, had found out from the local people that this was a place where um, there had been a church earlier. And so they built their church on the remains of a earlier church. When they excavated below the Byzantine church, they found uh, uh, remains that uh, were definitely Christian in origin. Um, thing, and things that, uh, you know, had Christian images and even uh, words and so on and so forth that they could identify as being Christian. So that uh, kind of confirmed for the... Uh, archaeologists the idea that the uh, 
that the house there was built over the house of St. Peter. And then uh, the church was built over that by the Byzantines. And then of course the Catholics built this beautiful place. So that's a lot of where, how the architecture is over there. Uh, you don't know what you're looking at until you dig below it. <laughs> a long way. Yeah. Yeah. But that's how they find out. It's a fascinating thing. Oh, archaeology is wonderful. Yeah, I've studied archaeology for, you know, past oh, 40 years. And mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a very interesting field for some of us. <coughs> anyway. Why does it appear that the seating doesn't face the altar? Or am I missing something? No, no. It, it's, it's church in the round. Yeah, it's a different, oh, okay. uh, but I think, um, again, uh, the Romans have this sense that, you know, if this was the church of St. Peter, and they would say it was a church where Jesus stayed, okay, mm -hmm. and this is really kind of as holy a place as one could find, and so you want people to be able to see it, and oh. so you put the altar in a place where it looks out towards the sea, you know, the altar is facing us. And the people would be sitting in the round, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. It is, it is a different concept, but it is saying that, the, that we are the church together, mm -hmm. which is a kind of a, it's a very um, traditional idea, but it's not one that um, a lot of uh, Catholics are aware of these days. Now they are, but uh, so anyway, yeah, that's a, that's how it is, and uh, so anyway, all right, we can get back to the text now, after all this little excursion into the other mm -hmm. stuff. All right, so this is one day in the life of Jesus and his disciples. Jesus has done nothing with these disciples yet mm -hmm. until this morning when he goes into the synagogue with them. And that's when he, uh, he runs across that guy who has got an unclean spirit and casts out the unclean spirit, right? And that was he, last week, right? Yeah, what? Yeah, last week. Yeah, well, yeah well, that, that was last week, right? All right, yeah. now, as soon as as soon as, all right, this is the way uh, Mark writes, <clears throat> the word really is immediately. <laughs> okay. But because, you know, because we are more refined thinkers, the translators put as soon as. If we were reading it as Mark wrote it, it would say immediately Jesus left the synagogue, okay? Mark uses that word immediately a lot. Okay. Yes. It's like like when you are showing slides and you say next, now, mm. you know, right? That's the way Mark does it. So they left the synagogue and they entered the house of Simon and so on, right? So you saw the distance. It's, it's practically nothing. Mm. It would be like going from... Uh, from the you know entrance of our church to the driveway, you know the the street entrance of the church to the glass entrance, you know it's about that much of a distance, not very far. And the mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. They told him about her at once. Now there's no explanation of why they did that except for the fact that perhaps they, well, perhaps they had compassion on her because she was sick, but maybe Jesus could do something for her. Mm -hmm. Or what else? They're worried about her. They were worried about her. I'm going to well, be... They, they, they had just witnessed that he had um, healed that other man. He, he had... Yeah. <clears throat> all the, the spirits, to, the demons to come out of him. Yeah. So they were probably thinking that, you know, well, maybe they could, she, he could do something for the mother-in-law. Yeah. Can't you do something for her? Right, exactly. Yeah, it's like the other day when we had uh, 
Jimmy over here to work on some things in our family room, and I brought him upstairs to show him the bathroom. <laughs> there was something that needed to be done. You know, can you help out with this too? <laughs> uh, it could be. It could be also that they were expecting her to uh, provide a meal for them, and uh, she was sick. Right. So they may have had ulterior motives there too. Yeah. You know, Super Bowl Sunday coming up. You know, it's the time for the women to get out there and put all the snacks together. <laughs> Why did just the women have to do it? Why well, not? But I'm <laughs> saying, I'm saying, I'm I'm putting it back in the first century. <laughs> right, in the first century. In the first century. In the first century, the women. The first were, century is no different. In first century, the, the women were in control. And they, they provided all the sustenance for these lazy men who had had a hard time, you know, paying attention in church, okay? <laughs> Good work. Anyway, all right, I'm just making fun of this. But it, it gives you a picture, though, that, uh, you know, Jesus hears about her. And so he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. All right? Now, that word lifted her up is an interesting word. Uh, in, in English, uh, it doesn't really mean a lot to us, but if you were looking at it in Greek, and then you looked at the end of the gospel, where God lifted Jesus up from the grave, it's the same word. Mm -hmm. It's resurrection. So uh, it's that kind of a thing, that there's some kind of, it's more than just, uh, you know, helping somebody, helping an old lady get up. And she might have been 35 years old by this point, you know. Old, that would have been old. Yeah. yeah. Right. Back in those. Yeah. So he took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her. And she began to do her diaconia. She began to serve them. That's the Greek word, diaconia. All right. So again, you know, Jesus reaches out lifts her up, cures her, and of course, immediate response is uh, for her to do something. And thereby, we know that she is actually better. Mm -hmm. That's the proof. That's the proof that she was cured. So, now the day is finally coming to an end. The sun has set. And this is a time for people to go to bed, normally. But that's not what happened. They, whoever they are, all right, the people of Capernaum, whatever, all right, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, all right? The whole city was gathered around the door. Well, you know, that's kind of a generalization, I'm sure. But there they were. And what does Jesus do? He didn't say, well, <laughs> I've had a long day. You know, it's hectic going to church and teaching and all that kind of stuff. I, I need to, you know, take some, take a break. No, he uh, stays up and he cures many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Mm. And coincidentally, he doesn't allow the demons to speak. Mm -hmm. The demons spoke in the synagogue, but that was the last, Jesus is going to have the last word. Amen. But they knew him. That's an interesting phrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that sense of, you know, um, Rudolf Otto in his book, uh, The Idea of the Holy, um, talks about what he calls numinous, N-U-M-I-N-O-U-S, a numinous quality. And that's kind of what seems to be implied here, that Jesus had, there was something about Jesus that, uh, you know, kind of emanated from him. And the d demons recognized it immediately. Yeah, that's well, what we call we call it charisma. Yeah, right, right, right. It's a corruption, really. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, we would describe somebody that way, yeah. Mm. So, you know, this is what Je uh, Jesus winds up doing. Now, this is the very, very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Okay? So, you know, in effect, Jesus is at a point where he could easily put up a sign saying, you know, the doctor is in. Make your appointments now. Mm. Right? But what does he do uh, that night or under the cover of darkness? Mm -hmm. well, it's still very dark. He, go, he goes out to pray. The next goes day. out to a deserted place where there's nobody yeah. around. Okay. And there, there he prays. Right. He asks for the help from the father. Yeah. Yeah. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. You know, that's kind of an interesting reaction, too. Think about that. You know, why are they doing that? They didn't know what Jesus was up to. They might have thought he had, had they witnessed him. Had he left them? <clears throat> had he been kidnapped? You know, whatever, you know. Uh, but, you know, all of a sudden they knew he wasn't there. And they go mm -hmm. hunting for him. Literally, like, you know, and... Uh, His parents did that, too. Joseph yeah, and Mary. Yeah. Later on. Yeah. He was, when, when he was 12. You read it, yeah. And, yeah. And he was... And both times, I mean, this is how I read it. Since he's in a solitary place and he was play, praying, he was doing the Father's will. He yeah, was, yeah. When he so, went to the temple, he was in the... He was, you know... In the Father's will, when he's going to pray, he's in the Father's will. Mm -hmm. He's not asking for direction. Well, maybe he was asking for direction. It doesn't say what he was praying, but right. He was, well, he was he was asking for direction from his father. Mm -hmm. it, it could be, yeah. For when they found him, they said to him, "Everyone is searching for you." Well, again, that's probably quite an overgeneralization. Uh, I doubt there were thousands of people looking for him, uh, but it probably means, you know, uh, Andrew and I and James and John, the four of us, because that's all he had right now at this point. I don't think the mother-in-law would have gotten up to go looking. So, you know, everyone is searching for you. Well, all four of us are looking for you. All right. And how does he respond? He said, let's go into the next towns that I may preach there. Also, because for this purpose, I have come forth. That's right. Okay. That's what he came out to do. All right. So, yes. To... Yeah. What I'm wondering. Say? Well, as I mentioned before, uh, the way I, I interpret this passage is, I, I think, you know, Jesus could have put out the sign saying, you know, the doctor is in, make your appointments now, right? Um, and it could be that that's what the disciples thought he was going to do. Maybe that explains a little bit of their uh, eagerness to find him. Well, weren't they looking for a political leader that would well, stand up? Against the Romans, in the when you look in the larger sense, yeah. But this is you got to keep this in the context of <clears throat> Jesus has just called these four disciples. They haven't even, you know, seen him in action other than in, in the synagogue that morning. Mm. You know, I find it very interesting that this is these two these two groups that had a lot of demons in them was right after Jesus was in the, uh, the temptations of Jesus when he was in the desert being tempted by, by Satan. So it's almost like, okay, he beat me, but I'm going to keep sending out these demons to, you know, oh. beat him down. Well, yeah, of course, they may have already been there. <laughs> no, but I'm saying even to, to send out more because they didn't want him to succeed. Yeah. Jesus didn't, so that he would, no, wouldn't have the followers and couldn't do what he was sent to do. Well, in the time of Jesus, there were probably many people who were possessed by demons. 
And uh, in fact, as we read through the Gospel of Mark, which we won't be doing at great length because Lent is coming up, but uh, if you were in the Thursday morning group, <laughs> you'd see that Jesus uh, has several uh, exorcism experiences in the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. That seems to be one of the uh, significant uh, minor themes of Mark's Gospel. Jesus is doing battle with the demons which again, you know, has a remarkably contemporary feel to it now. But this is Jesus' answer. He says, uh, I'm not gonna, we're not going to stay here. Keep in mind, this is Simon's house. And you can see it's not, you know, it wasn't a tent. It was a house. <laughs> it was a pretty sturdy building there. Uh, and, you know, who knows what Simon and Andrew and James and John were thinking uh, when they saw all the crowds and they saw Jesus, the success of Jesus and curing all these people and so on, and the enthusiasm that the people had and all the rest, you know, and that might be why they say everyone's searching for you. It's almost a, a rebuke of Jesus saying, you know, why are you going off, you know, like this? But Jesus is very clear. Let's go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. Also. But that is what I came out to do. I came here to proclaim that message. The healing is a good thing to do. But that's my, not my primary job. You know, I, I think of a book I read where it's talking about management and so on and one of the slogans there was stick to the knitting you know uh know what you're there to do and stay with that mm -hmm. yep. that's what jesus uh that's how i read what jesus says here yep. I, I have came, a i came to some, yeah well some verses in my bible talk about what Jesus came to do and, and one of them is Matthew 5 17 where he says he didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets but to fulfill it another uh, verse in chapter 9 says um, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance in 9 13 so his message what you know his message was to call to call people to tell them about his kingdom right yeah yeah now keep in mind verse 15 of this same chapter you know uh jesus uh began to preach the time is fulfilled the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe in the good news mm -hmm. that was his message and coincidentally that was a message that he was taking on from his predecessor, John the Baptist. Yeah. But John the Baptist was preaching a baptism of repentance. Uh, and uh, Jesus is picking up where John left off. Mm -hmm. So he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues. Again, it's kind of interesting, you know, his strategy here. Um, we, we think of Jesus preaching like Sermon on the Mount. We have everybody sitting on the hillside and that sort of thing. Or you might think of Jesus being out in the boat, uh, you know, preaching to the people gathered on the shore. As, you know, we see him uh, in the Gospels. But uh, Mark uh, says he proclaimed the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Again, the demons are right there. Is this when the Pharisees started to move against him? Well, you, you can you can tell that they're going to. <laughs> yeah, because these are the, the, you know, he's not hiding out. Right. He's going right to the synagogue. So if anybody's going to be upset, it's going to be the people who hang out in the synagogues. Mm -hmm. And that would be the Pharisees. Well, also that... It doesn't, the Bible really doesn't uh, expand on it, but he was in the line of King David. Yeah. So he was a threat 
to the hierarchy. Yeah, well, later on, yeah, you know, they, of course, they don't know much about Jesus at this moment. Mm -hmm. it's just the beginning of his thing. But yeah, uh, later on, by the time he, when he enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, what are they saying? You know, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's three so years. That, that fear had to exist long before that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the prophecy was there, but the people may not have known it. No, no, no I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting yeah. that the, the Pharisees knew it. Um, yeah, that was, there were controversies with the Pharisees about mm -hmm. that sort of thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were times when they, they battled just about that particular issue. But it comes out in the in the course of uh, you know conversation uh, rather than you know it's not like they had uh, yes, yes. prior knowledge of that mm -hmm. yeah but yeah he was a threat but he was not afraid he went right into the synagogues yes because he believed he was destined to be king um. Well, it's not really clear that that's the case because in those cases where Jesus was, um, well, like in the uh, in Gospel of John with the feeding of the 5,000, um, Jesus uh, very specifically leaves the area because the people wanted to make him king. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, for him but to be a king with a different meaning of the word. Right. He is a king. Yeah. Not a king. He's not a king on this earth. Right. He's not an because, earthly king. Because he said to Pilate, if my, if my kingdom was from here, my servants would fight. Right. But my kingdom isn't from here. That's right. It comes from God. Right. Yeah, his authority comes from God. That's what he's saying there. Yeah, if, if I were just, uh, you know, somebody that people wanted me to be king, kind of like electing somebody king, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, then people would fight. And we have yeah. a contemporary example of that, too, just a couple of weeks ago. Right. <laughs> you know, some crazy people. But that, you know, Jesus knew that that's how people act. Mm -hmm. He said, my authority doesn't come from people like that. My authority comes from God. And that, you know, if you think about it now, he's talking to Pontius Pilate. <clears throat> Pontius Pilate is in his job because the one who claims to be the son of God, Augustus, has put him there. Mm -hmm. well, actually, it's Tiberius, but yeah. Okay, so, you know. Tiberius was the emperor. Yeah. Yeah. And right. So, the emperor. Tiberius said it was so, it was so. Right. Yeah, but they, but they they were expected to worship the emperor mm -hmm. as Absolutely. God, okay? Yes. And so he Jesus was, uh, was carrying God. that, yeah. He was, the, the name Caesar is not a name of a person, although we take it that way. Right, right. It meant, it meant that he was a direct descendant from God. Yeah. And after Julius Caesar, that's how they looked at their emperors. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Yep, yeah, so then you're seeing that the, uh, the Christian gospel, even in the first century, was going head to head with the, um, uh, the political system of that generation. Oh, absolutely. And that's what we tend to... Uh, not notice that much and except for a few instances so well, was this 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 was before the christians were uh persecuted or after yeah it's before before of course when it's written down <clears throat> when it's written down it's uh christians are starting to be persecuted and by the time the later gospels uh uh were written uh they yeah more persecution was underway mm -hmm. okay and, but the threat was always there. So, all right. Well, our time is really up, and uh, I think we'll 
uh, <clears throat> get moving along here. These are these pictures I showed you. These are these words. And you can think about, you know, what does it mean to say that Jesus is the one who is uh, bringing that message of the kingdom to all the world? And what does that mean for us? Well, that's really good news. Yeah. Yeah. For, from our point of view, it's good news. And oh. also from our point of view, it's, 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 a, it's a mission. When you put it on a time scale, you realize that a man who only lived for 30 years, 33 years, mm -hmm. affected the world this day. Yep, it's still affecting the world today. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Incredible life. Yes. <clears throat> Three-year ministry. I don't know how I could exist if I didn't have Jesus. Yeah. It's such a, an integral part of my, um, my, I guess, my soul. Uh -huh. Yeah, one author I remember from much earlier uh, talked about Jesus Christ as the still point in the turning world. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like, uh, you know, true north, <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, the North Pole. The whole world rotates around that. That's how Christians look at Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a prayer for today, and I'm going to ask my wife to read it. Okay. So. All right. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, <clears throat> next week. Uh, on Valentine's Day, we won't be talking about St. Valentine, although that would probably be an interesting thing to talk about. Yep. But um, it is the Feast of the Transfiguration of Our Lord, <clears throat> which is a festival of the church that used to be observed uh, on a specific fixed date in the calendar, August 6th, which happens to be my son's, our son's birthday. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, uh, in the 20th century, the date got uh, uh, moved, and it became the last Sunday after the Epiphany. And so it is a very last Sunday of this particular time of the year, and it is uh, the, the event that then uh, precedes Ash Wednesday and uh, the season of Lent. So that's what we'll be looking at next time. Second Kings 2, 1 to 12. And Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9, uh, the transfiguration of our Lord. And then we'll be talking also about things that are going to be happening during the season of Lent. Now, coincidentally, having led up to that, um, I uh, think I've convinced Linda <coughs> to uh, do the study, uh, which is uh, going to follow uh, what we're doing now with Unafraid. Uh, by Amy Jo Levine, and it is, uh, I'm trying to remember the title of it, um, mm. has to do with the passion, okay, and, Walking and profiles stuff. of the passion stuff, or something yeah. like that, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> she's a very interesting speaker, uh, and we have the videos uh, like we do of uh, from Abingdon, uh, but they, um, it also has a book, and so we ordered 10 copies of the book, uh, they're 10 bucks a piece, so we figured why not get it, and um, we'll be using that uh, through the season of Lent on Tuesdays uh, as a Tuesday study, and uh, it really focuses on the days of Holy Week in particular, uh, so it, it's a little bit out of sync with the uh, Lenten uh, places of the Passion, which is a six-week series, but... Uh, moves a little bit more slowly. Uh, but anyway, it should be interesting because uh, there will be that overlapping between uh, the Tuesday Bible study and the Wednesday services throughout Lent. And then we get to Holy Week and then maybe the snow will be gone. 
Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, right. yeah. All right. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I look forward to uh, future times together. Thank you. It was another yeah. wonderful session. Yeah. God give you his blessing. Bye-bye. Hey. And to you. Very good. I'm going to turn it off. You can see one another. There we go. Yep. I'm signing. All righty. Take care, everybody. Okay. Bye. Care, I'll see you. We have a teen ministry tonight at 7. 7 o'clock teen ministry. That's right. All right. I'll see you later. We're going to be talking about our visit from the bishop. Yes. Great. Yep. Okay. I'll right. see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.